Hey everyone, this is Nick and probably no one will watch this Linux and open source news video because everyone is too busy spending the holidays with their friends and their family. Oh, wait, you mean to tell me that not everyone celebrates Christmas? Well, in this case, welcome friends. And this week kind of feels like Groundhog Day because once again, the EU slaps Meta across the face, this time for a dominant position abuse. We also have Wayland finally getting fractional scaling support, like good fractional scaling support, so no more blurry apps. And we have the release of Linux Mint 21.1, which is a small version number, but a very big improvement. And talking about improvement, how about you improve your control over your own internet connection, thanks to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by Safing. Safing makes the Portmaster an open source tool to take back control of your internet connection. It's free of charge and it lets you see every connection every application makes. And it lets you act on these connections by blocking ads and trackers, malware, not safe for work stuff or scams, with auto-blocking capabilities and even the ability to use a DNS provider of your choice. You can of course create your own rules globally or per application. Portmaster is available as a DEB or an RPM package, it's in the AUR, or you can also install it on Windows. Using it is free of charge and they have paid tiers, starting at 3 euros per month to support the development, or 9.9 euros per month if you want the total package, including the SPN, which is a VPN on steroids that uses a different IP address for every connection, so you're truly impossible to track. So, click the link in the description to download the Portmaster. So, another week, another slap from Meta administered by the European Union. The European Commission informed the company that they think they have breached antitrust rules for online classified ads through their Facebook Marketplace service. The problem seems to be that this marketplace is tied into Facebook, which obviously gives that service an insane reach out of the box something no competitor could hope to match. They say that all Facebook users automatically have access to Marketplace, whether they want it or not, and that it gives Facebook a substantial advantage. They also say Facebook imposes unfair trading conditions on other services that advertise on Facebook or Instagram, another of Meta's companies. The terms and conditions stipulate that Facebook can use advertising data from competitors to improve their own service and this is considered unjustified, disproportionate, and not necessary to the marketplace service. Basically, they say it's a burden on competitors and doesn't benefit the market as a whole. The Commission will still need to rule on whether this constitutes a breach, but if they do so, it will be an abuse of a dominant market position and thus be sanctioned with a fine up to 10% of Meta's annual worldwide turnover. Facebook, of course, has a right to defend themselves and will probably also be given some time to fix these practices. It is just great to see these companies taken down a peg and being brought back by the EU into a normal, fair, competitive market that doesn't artificially erase any potential competitor just by the sheer size of the service they have to compete against. The EU really is on fire these days and I love it. But Nick, KDE sucks at multi-monitors and fractional scaling, they say on my comment section every time I talk about KDE. Well, I guess I will lose some engagement in the future because the next releases of Plasma should bring nice fixes for all of that. First, the Wayland fractional scaling protocol has landed and will be used in Plasma 6. It will let Qt, the toolkit used by KDE, turn on the fractional scaling support it always had on X11, so they won't render at 2x and then scale it down, thus making everything blurry. And performance should also be better, along with less battery use. GTK apps currently don't support that just yet, but it should happen pretty soon. And when is Plasma 6 going to be available? Well, if I'm not mistaken, it will be the version after Plasma 5.27, so in a few months. On top of that, KDE also fixed their multi-screen implementation. They now use an index-based system to list monitors, which means that disconnecting and reconnecting displays should result in better stability, reliability, and stuff should generally not switch positions randomly, jump around the screen or display on the wrong monitor. 
It won't magically fix every multi-monitor bug, but it should still make for a much better experience. Other stuff they've been working on include the ability for X11 apps under Wayland to still access global shortcuts and key presses. Discover got a SteamOS backend, which means it will be able to perform system updates on the desktop mode of the Steam Deck. And the user interface keeps getting some nice fixes and improvements. Plasma 5.27 is shaping up to be an amazing release, but I'm really looking forward to KDE 6. They will work on activities, redefining what they do and how they work. They'll have wallpapers that span across multiple displays, more multi-monitor fixes, a theming engine that's comparable to Quantum, but out of the box, fractional scaling, and a lot more. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to Plasma 6. And another privacy violation this week, this time from Epic Games. They have agreed to pay $520 million to the US Federal Trade Commission due to violating children's privacy laws and tricking users into making unwanted charges. The fine is split between $275 million for violating children's privacy and $245 million that they will have to refund customers they tricked into paying. This all applies to Fortnite specifically, where Epic used dark patterns to push kids to buy skins and other digital worthless goods. And they also specifically targeted children with that game and collected data on these kids without obtaining their parents' consent first. The default settings in-game, enabling live text and voice communication, are also to blame here as it had the potential to harm kids and teenagers through online bullying, threats, harassment, and exposure to dangerous material, including incitation to suicide. Epic employees already had expressed concerns about all of this as early as 2017, but they were ignored. Epic put out their own statement saying they never intended to reach that point and that they want to be at the forefront of consumer protection. They'll make significant changes to these various systems, including parental controls, daily spending limits, and more. Something that's easy to do and say after you willfully ignored all the complaints that your employees had for five freaking years. So I guess that the fines must not be high enough if these companies still feel like they can just pay the fine or settle afterwards and it will still make them a profit. Linux Mint 21.1 is now out for everyone after they released their beta last week. For a small dot update, it's a big release with tons of look and feel changes. The main one being that it loses its green theme by default, going to a blue one with yellow folders. Kind of emulating Windows, I guess. Of course, previous themes are still available. Use of color has been toned down. Certain desktop icons have been removed from the default since they weren't that useful. There are new mouse pointers and sounds out of the box, plus more icon themes to choose from. On top of that, it now fully supports Flatpak in the update manager and a software installer as well, letting you choose between the repo version of an app or its Flatpak counterpart. There's a new ISO verification tool to ensure everything is okay before installing, and Cinnamon gained a configurable corner bar that lets you pick a few actions to perform when clicking it, hovering it, or middle-clicking it. Mint will also ask you for your password a lot less, notably when removing a Flatpak app if it was installed for the user only, and the password will be remembered between actions in the same app, so you won't be prompted every time you uninstall multiple apps one after the other. The Mate variant also will gain all these new features and look changes, and so will the XFCE version although none of these gain the corner bar of Cinnamon or any updates to their desktop environment themselves. It looks like a pretty great release that I will definitely cover in the next video on the channel next week. And also, please, Linux Mint team, stop releasing your freaking updates two days before Christmas. It's becoming a bit of a habit and it's not great, okay? Now, on the GNOME side of things, not as many big changes as in KDE, but there's still a huge one. The file picker finally gets a grid view with thumbnails, 18 years after people started asking for it. And that's pretty good. Now, on top of that, the settings got a bunch of polish dropped on various panels, like the Thunderbolt one, the About panel, and the Printer panel. 
the portal service that lets sandboxed apps interact with the system and each other securely has been updated as well, with a new service detecting sandboxed apps running without a window, which should let desktop environments better interact with these background services. And there's the global shortcuts portal that lets applications use keyboard shortcuts even when they're not focused. GNOME doesn't implement that portal just yet, but I would be surprised if they didn't really soon. There's also a new app called Live Captions, which captions your desktop audio or mic in real time in English, something that's really, really awesome and that I will take a look at while I'm working on starting a Linux news podcast. Pods, the Podman client, now lets you download and upload files to and from a container and gets tons of visual improvements. And Loop, the new image viewer, shows way more of the image's EXIF data, including the GPS location where the picture was taken, with the ability to open the Maps app to look at it. Now, finally, thumbnails in the file picker. Jeez, why did it take so long? But yeah, it's finally going to happen when they update it in, I guess, GTK or the GNOME core libraries. And also that portal for desktop applications for using global shortcuts, one of the main things that held Wayland back. Finally fixed. Cool. And now for the gaming news. First, we have the release of SteamOS 3.4, a big, big update that updates the desktop mode using KDE all the way up to version 5.26. And it rebases the operating system on the latest Arch Linux packages. It fixes a lot of bugs and performance issues. It lets users use the performance heads-up display in a more space-efficient horizontal layout. And the OS now supports Trim again for its internal SSD and your SD card. They quickly released two small fixes afterwards to fix issues with SD cards and HDMI audio going to sleep. There's also a new Vulkan Video API, which lets applications use Vulkan to hardware decode and encode video files. Now, this could be used in video games, thus solving the various video format problems that we have in apps running with Proton, or even in desktop applications like media players. For now, it only supports H.264 and H.265, but more codecs should come in the future. On top of that, the Steam Deck is now shipping to Asia. Customers from Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Taiwan will now receive their devices as well, which hopefully should increase the number of DEC and Linux users a bit. And that's always good for more game support. And finally, if you're old like me and you played the old Star Wars FPS called Dark Forces, you'll be happy to know that there's an open source Force engine that allows you to play that game on modern computers with a bunch of cool enhancements, like mod support, high resolution and widescreen support, GPU rendering, mouse sensitivity settings, full mouse look, controller support, a new safe system, and more. And of course, you can also play it like it was back in the day, at 320 by 200. Why you'd want to do that, I don't know, unless you hate your retinas. And if you love your retinas, well, today's sponsor's devices are a feast for the eyes. Tuxedo is a company based in Germany, but they ship worldwide a wide range of Linux desktops and laptops. And the main reason why you would want that instead of any old Windows computer that you would slap Linux on it is because they're designed to run Linux. The hardware has been picked specifically to run well with Linux, which means that when you buy from Tuxedo, you know that you can just install anything on it and it's gonna run smoothly and perfectly. Plus, they have a big range which should cover every need and every price point, whether you're looking for a laptop, a gaming device, a tower, a NUC, they have everything. They're all customizable, upgradable, repairable, and you can even really customize your devices with your own keyboard layout, for example, laser etched on the keys of your laptop, or your own logo laser etched on the lid of your laptop, or even on your desktop. You decide. So if you need a new device, you want to make sure it runs Linux well, and you want to support Linux's development, click the link in the description and get yourself a Tuxedo laptop or desktop. So thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, well, there's that dislike button. And there's also a comment to tell me why you disliked it. 
And if you really enjoy the channel and you want me to make more of these videos, give the gift of the super thanks button or the PayPal link in the description or become a Patreon or a YouTube member and get access to a weekly podcast and the right to vote on the next topics that I'll cover on the channel. And if you don't care about that, well, the links are still in the description and I can just wish you happy holidays, a Merry Christmas if you celebrate that and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.